Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 13, titled Yankee Dollar. It originally premiered on January 17th, 1986. The director was Aaron Lipstadt. He also directs Payback and El Viejo, which the episodes we have not seen yet. The writer is Daniel Pine, who also wrote the episode we did just, well, not last week, but two weeks ago. He's also written a bunch of other show uh, episodes underneath a pseudonym. So we've seen him a bunch. He's a showrunner. He's a producer. This was also co-written by John Mankiewicz, who wrote the teleplay for Out Where the Buses Don't Run. So we have some classic Vice people on this episode. I love how he writes under a pseudonym. Like, when I'm <laughs> when I'm really famous, I don't want people to know I was attached to this garbage. <laughs> I think what it was supposed to be is that he wrote under a pseudonym that way people didn't know that one of the producers was writing the show. Like, oh, that's how this one got written. They let the producer write one. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Before we get started, like chickens, we always go on each other's lives. And guys, you can tell by my voice, I am still sick. And that's why we missed last week. You can also tell that there's no Melissa this week. We are very, very sad that Melissa is not on this episode. But it's because she's sick. The flu has run rampant through my house and has demolished everything in its path. We're at the point now where we just have to burn this house down and move to a new one. Phoenix, Arizona is officially under quarantine. (laughs) Stay out of Phoenix. (laughs) So last weekend, when we were getting ready to record our episode, I had to text you and say, look, I'm not going to be able to do it. It's because I sounded like a hungover duck who had just eaten a bunch of rocks. There was no way. it's It's amazing because people always blame the weather for getting sick. Mm -hmm. But it's been like 80, 90 degrees where you are. We're just getting out of freezing temperatures at night. (laughs) Last Saturday, last Saturday, I was, it was one of my worst days. So Saturday and then Monday were the two worst days. On both of those days, I'm like sweating profusely, but still freezing cold. It was 99 degrees that day. 99. You can't, can't blame the weather for this one. (laughs) No. Sticky kids. Pretty sure the baby was patient zero, and she's just been laughing the whole time. She's such a little trooper. <laughs> let's um, let's just do an old fashioned rundown on this show, John. Let's Duke's a hazard. This let's uh, let's get these Duke boys inside the general Lee and get over and talk about this episode. We open up this episode in what is the most fantastic way possible. We have, John, two guys that we can easily play. We can easily beat anyone in a cosplay contest. I have very much a swipe uh-huh. tech body type. You very much look like Vice Jesus, especially with the beard. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And Vice Jesus is very passionate about going to see 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> Yeah, Slytek is complaining that he's tired of the kids looking at him in the theater, like, because they're there to watch it. It's Zeno is going on and on about how the 101 Dalmatians is a tale about the end of the nuclear family. I just love those two guys now. I just love those guys. I know. Why can't we be, why can't we, we watch, uh, Zwitek and Vice Jesus show? <laughs> like, I miss going on adventures with them. When are we going to get an episode where it's their case? I mean, just in this episode where we get this and then we get later where they're like dressed up like a sea captain <laughs> on, on a boat with the yellow slicker in the hat with the, like a little kid. He's got the, the floppy hat with the front turned up and he's got his galoshes on. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, meanwhile, Gina and Trudy are getting ready to go out and make a final bust on something that, that they've been working, so they go to leave. And then we Gina can- and Trudy are working. <laughs> Zoytek and Vice Jesus are arguing about going to see 101 Dalmatians, and Tubbs is making a booty call. He I never wasn't even sure at first if he was making a booty call. It sounded almost like he was calling a 900 hotline. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, talk to me. You. <laughs> you gotta do yeah, what with the feet? <laughs> and poor old Sonny, he's just sitting there, head down, doing some paperwork. He's got nothing to do that night. Tubbs even invites him, you know. <laughs> yeah, t- t- Tubbs is like, "Hey, you, I mean, I'm gonna go smash this, but if you want to get in on this three way, you can come <laughs> along with me. <laughs> you can come along and be the vanilla and our Oreo." <laughs> 
was not ready for that. So everyone's taken off. They all have stuff to do. The B team has a date. The ladies are going to go work. Tubbs is going to go get someone pregnant again. Crockett's just all alone sitting in the office. And he's like, no, it's fine. I'm going to work. I got nothing going on. I'm just going to finish up this work. And as soon as everyone leaves, he's like, I wonder if I could hit up that one lady. This whiskey's starting to wear <laughs> <Yeah>. off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, he do- he doesn't even call the lady. He calls the airport just to find out when her plane lands. And then this yeah, kind of because that's not that's yeah. not creepy. <laughs> and then this turns into like a montage because then the music starts playing crockett heads over to the airport he's waiting with flowers at the gate he's waiting for a stewardess Crockett's getting two tickets to paradise <laughs> the stewardess's name is sarah and he just like i think he's just taking a swing in the dark right he he brings her flowers they kiss he gives her a ride home he's kind of hoping that that she's gonna invite him in so all that like hey i'm gonna stay late and do work y'all go have fun jealous crockett said in real fast he's like which one in this book right here will get me laid the fastest i i need a booty call who who's the <laughs> night fighter i call <laughs> it was almost like he started singing the two short song cocktails in his head it's like where's sarah uh-huh. what does sarah do again <laughs> Sarah, by the way, played by Audrey Matson, who, if to no surprise, also played a flight attendant in an episode of Law and <laughs> Order and had a role in Crime Story. She became an English as a second le- as a second language teacher in New York. She speaks French, Italian, and Korean and Chinese. Damn. So if you need to learn English, contact Audrey and you live in New York. Contact Audrey Madsen. Um, uh, I, I think she's on what one of those professional sites. I think yeah, she might like be LinkedIn. on there. Yeah. In this montage. We see, like, he, they're like talking over it too. There's just some parts where it's more music than it is. And it takes her over to her house. He tries to invite himself in. Sarah's like, no, no, thanks. Thanks for the lift though. And then Crockett runs back to his car. He realizes that she left the flowers and then he runs back up to the door to get to, he runs back up to the door to bring her back the flowers and he can hear her screaming inside the house. He breaks in, goes over to the bathroom. And she's laying on the floor, gra- grabbing her stomach. She's screaming in pain. She's got the diabetes and her sugars <laughs> as well. <laughs> Which is funny because later we meet someone named Sugarman. Yeah. No coincidence been a there. Theme this season. <laughs> yeah, sugar's been a theme this season. We also had the great sugar heist. <laughs> Sunny swoops her up, takes her to the hospital. They get to the hospital and we watch her die. And that's the end of the open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that escalated quickly. Um, <laughs> question. Went from trying to get lucky to dead. <laughs> I have a question. How come Sonny is never a suspect? Because he sure is around for a lot of weird ass shit. I don't know, but they need to stop dating criminals. Um, <laughs> Start having Sonny call criminals to set up a date because that's always their downfall. I also have a, a joke about swallowing and spitting. Leave that one out. <laughs> When we come back from the opening credits, we have a brief scene at the hospital where Sonny's sitting alone in the room. The doctor comes in, and this is, it's short, but it's important. The doctor comes in and tells Sonny, who is unaware that he's a police officer, that Sarah died of a cocaine overdose after one of the five balloons in her stomach burst open. There were, so again, so I can say there was five, so if there was was four more in there. Mm -hmm. And she says, we're going to have to, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to contact the authorities. And he's like, you already have. Like, haha, okay, yes, Sonny's a cop. Why is Sonny a suspect right now? (laughs) Why aren't there police officers interrogating him? I'm sure if that scene had gone on longer, the doctor would have been like, here, now let me tell you about another patient we have. (laughs) This guy's, uh, this guy's screwed. (laughs) Let me show you a few of his x-rays. Patient, patient confidentiality means nothing here. <laughs> you just showed up with this lady. I can tell you everything. Yes. When we leave from the hospital, we have a driving scene where Tubbs and Crockett, they're heading over to Sarah's house. I think it's the next day, right? When they get there, there's a couple of people knocking on the door. Uh, of course, Tubbs and Crockett are suspicious. So they come running over, guns out, never announce 
themselves that they're police officers but come to find out it's just a guy trying to sell his car to sarah and that's why sarah was getting the money she was just trying to buy some nice stuff by smuggling cocaine from yeah. columbia she wanted to buy a beamer and my thought is is that if she had just swung a little lower maybe volkswagen she'd be alive <laughs> maybe th- only three so, balloons instead of five exactly so but those <laughs> jehovah's witnesses will never be coming back <laughs> When they're inside, we hear the talk between Tubbs and Crockett that Sarah was doing a flight that was going from Miami to Bogota to Paris and then back to Miami. She's been doing that for two years. So who knows how long she's been sneaking these balloons in. We Crockett see our- becomes emotional, Crockett, in this scene. And he, he kind of stands with his back away from the camera. And I'm mm-hmm. just going to summarize his little speech. I'm going to miss banging her. <laughs> Well, that's pretty, pretty much what he says. I mean, in other <laughs> words, but that's pretty much what he says. This, you know what's funny, too, is that we only – this is like the last little bit of the story that we get about Sarah. Other than Sonny saying every once in a while, just reminding people that she died. And then we yeah. somehow bring it all back together by the end of the episode. But they never really, like, find out who else is smuggling cocaine. I'm sure there's a whole gang of people that are doing this scam. And they might have tried yeah. to get that information out of Glide or Sugarman or Sabato before they all get killed. Yeah, I know. I mean, the the police work in this is definitely lacking because I feel like there was a whole operation and they kind of just focus in on the guy that killed my girlfriend. It seems like there's other stuff going on with these people. This is a pretty deep, well-funded, well-organized crime ring. So outside the house, we see a Corvette comes pulling up. And again, Sonny and Rico get suspicious. Sonny comes out, says, hey, what's up, bro? And the guy who's out there, he's like, his name's Tim. He's like, no, nothing. I'm cool. Uh, I think I got the wrong house. And then Tubbs comes out and Tim goes, oh, shit. And he tries to run. I love Sonny in this, though. He goes popping out like, hi, the drug dealer. (laughs) Sonny finally catches Tim in the ocean. He actually tackles him into the ocean, pulls him out. Tim says that he's Sarah's brother. And then Crockett gets a little bit of emotion. He's like, hey, I hate, I hate to tell you, but your sister's dead. She died yesterday. And Tim, the only thing Tim wants to know is where's the body? Which, of course, means that I know she's got drugs. And so Sonny punches him out. Yeah. We, so, uh, th- I mean, I got to give it to Sonny. He takes him out pretty quick, man. Oh, yeah. No, when it's someone in his little black book, he takes it very personal. <laughs> They take Tim over to the precinct and they're interrogating him. Tim ends up saying eventually after some em- so- some empty threats from Sonny that Sarah just wanted 5K. She was going to buy the car. and But he doesn't know who the source is. He knows that Charlie Glide is the middleman. So that's where Tubbs and Crockett are off to next. They're going over to, Char- to Charlie Glide's place. Now, and this is a nice so, setup. Yeah. So well, Tim being played by Clayton Rohner, who also had guest appearances in a number of cop shows. TJ Hooker, Hill Street mm-hmm. Blues, LA Law, CSI. He did a guest spot on Crossing Jordan, which is probably where I know him from. And most recent, uh, Justified. So he's, he's still bouncing he gets around, around cop shows. Yeah. Yeah, still getting around. So probably playing the we- same Weasley guy. Yeah, you know, hey, man, you know, you got to uh, do what you know. <laughs> well, the duo head over to, Char- to Charlie Glides. And this is funny how it opens. And then things just start to get weird from here. They're watching Charlie's place. He's having like a party. They're watching it from out in the water. Sonny finally spies him and he goes pulling up to the dock and just kicks Tubbs out. It's like, hey, you're walking from here, yeah, bitch. Dude. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? Just all of a sudden just rolls up like, all right, get out. Like, you're not invited to this party. <laughs> Didn't want to be embarrassed by Tubbs' terrible Jamaican accent. <laughs> get out of here. You're embarrassing. I'm going to a nice party. <laughs> okay, so he kicks him out. And then he just puts uh, like twenty more feet down the dock. It's like there. nothing. Yeah, he only goes. He goes like five more feet. He's like I don't know who that guy is. Hold my boat for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sunny goes right up to go talk to Charlie, and they already know each other. Charlie knows him as Sunny Burnett. Uh, Charlie is there with Max Rogo. He's like 
left hand man. They ditch Max and go talk inside. Uh, what ends up happening here is that Sunny says, I'm going to kind of bunch a bunch of things up here. So, because we have two different stories that are trying, that are trying to happen here. Mm-hmm. Sunny goes and talks to Charlie Glide. He says that he's got 10 keys stolen out of Miami Vice lockup. He needs help moving it. Glide says, I don't touch the stuff. I'm not, I'm not the man who actually moves the drugs. But I know of an even bigger deal that you might want in on Burnett. When we leave from Charlie's, we go over to the precinct and it's because the duo are looking to get their hands on some, something that they can use for setting, for setting up Charlie. They convince the security guard whose job it is to make sure that nothing disappears out of lockup, convince them to let them take this stack of cash that's in lockup. It's counterfeit cash which will be important way later in the episode. You're supposed to remember this now. Mm-hmm. And like a half hour from now, remember that that that's where they got the money. So then we go to Jamaican Tubbs. The Jamaican accent is back. He's meeting with Max, Charlie's left-hand guy, saying he's an associate of Johnny Souls, that he has money to buy drugs. So the setup here is, is that the duo are trying to work. Sonny's got drugs. He's trying to move. He needs fi- he needs financing. Tubbs or Cooper, he's got money looking to buy drugs. They both talk to different people inside of Charlie's organization. It is not surprising at all that Charlie puts this together very fast. What the hell is going on here? Yes. So the only thing I want to point out about these scenes, Crockett thinks he's very clever by calling cocaine nose whiskey. <laughs> um, and I don't think anyone else gets it. No, um, but he does say it's ready to pour. So, I mean, that brings the joke home, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and then the guy Tubbs meets up with, he's going to show you all different, all, a whole bunch of different ways to beat the government on taxes. Uh, but he left his money suit at home. <laughs> by the way, his character played by Austin Pendleton, who uh, you would know from movies Short Circuit. I'll give you the one role you'll definitely know, know him from. He is the stuttering lawyer in My Cousin Vinny. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's the one role you're definitely going to know him from. But he was also in Searching for Bobby Fisher, Mm -hmm. Mr. Nanny, Sergeant Bilko. He was in 11 episodes of Homicide Life on the Street and 11 episodes of Oz, bitch. (laughs) Oh, wow. Who knows what the hell happened to him in Oz? Maybe that's why he's not really doing that much more work. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that was it they broke them <laughs> it'll break it going inside we have a couple interesting scenes from glide's office first we have a really weird scene where charlie's answering a bunch of different phones and he's telling max to answer it and max he's like just yells out no and then charlie reminds him that like hey i used to have a guy that did this but he couldn't keep his mouth shut so I don't know what the scene was about, but it was a thing. Because then later that yeah. night, Sarah's... I will say this. Char- Charlie and Max are really, you know, buddy-buddy, you know. And they're always kind of joking around. And they take this whole crime thing very lightheartedly. They don't give a shit, right? Like, when they find out later that they know they're cops. Like, whatever, we'll use the cops. Cool. And then you see Max yeah. later, too, where he's hanging out at the bar with, like, six or eight w- women in bikinis. So like, eh. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just totally doesn't care. It's just, you know, roll with it, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're just out having a good time. <laughs> well, later that night, Tim goes to see Max, and Tim's really pissed off. He wants to go. He wants to see Charlie. He wants to know that he's, you know, he wants more work, basically. And Max tells him that he's not going to be their errand boy anymore. Tim goes to leave and Max pulls out a gun with a giant silencer on it and shoots and kills Tim. Now, two things here. One, the gun is comically large. It looks like the Joker's gun in the Tim Burton Batman movie. Dude, that is exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking like like it, it's the Joker's gun from the uh from the original. <laughs> Two. Like you just expect like a little a little thing to come out that that unrolls and says bang. <laughs> Well, two, Max holds it like he's going to escort the neighbor kid with the hose. (laughs) (laughs) Very true. And he's like shaking it around like, don't make me use this thing. Bang, bang. Like, I'm going to escort you with my super soaker if you don't get off my lawn. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Well, he kills him. And now we know how he ended up in Oz. (laughs) Well, yeah, later that night. 
the Miami PD find Tim, they fall, or they find his body in a ditch, and they call in Sonny just so that you can see. And Sonny's like, "Yeah, this is definitely the work of Charlie Glide." And the Look, local, Sonny, it's a dead guy. Okay. <laughs> What's great is that Sonny tells them it's like, "Yeah, this is definitely Charlie Glide," and the the detectives like, "Great." Like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? How are we going to touch Charlie Glide? Thanks for nothing, Sonny. Uh huh. <laughs> I just love that they call him because, I mean, it's like, at this point, I don't even know if there's an official. I mean, I guess that there is an official investigation. Maybe. I don't know. We haven't talked to C- Castillo in a while, so I don't know if any of this is official. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I love how the homicide detectives like, I, I better call Vice. You know, they're going to come stick their nose at this anyway. Yeah, they just get involved in it, whatever the hell's going on. Anyway, we can't stop them. They just, they all have police radios. They just show up. Yeah. (laughs) Next day, Max and Charlie are getting brunch. And Max is telling Charlie all about Cooper and his cash. And this is when I had a realization. And this is a deep Miami Vice realization and the always budget conscious Miami Vice. The man playing Charlie Glide is also the same actor who played Frederico Labrici, you know, of the Labrici family that is also the boss of Al Lombard. Uh Uh-huh. So. Oh, wow. So the man is still in charge of a major crime family in one storyline and is now the crime lord of a different ring in a different episode. And you know what? He's going to come back as Labrici in a later episode. Dude, that makes so much sense now. The guy who plays him is Ned Eisenberg. And Ned Eisenberg played t- uh, also played two characters on almost the same series. <laughs> he played a defense attorney on Law and & Order and then mm-hmm. played a different defense attorney on <laughs> Law & Order SVU. <laughs> so he played the same character with a different name, both defense attorneys on both Law & Orders. So he, he must just be good. I'm just, I'm watching them eat and I'm like, why have I seen this guy before? And then it dawned on me because he's the kid who takes over the Labrici family. And we see him in the episode Lombard where they meet at the ice cream parlor. Remember? And he like sticks his pinky oh, in, the, yeah. in the other guy's ice cream. Also, he has guest appearances on LA Law, NYPD Blue and Dragnet. Damn. Did you know Ed O'Neill was on Dragnet? <laughs> I, I never saw the original show. So, yeah. No. I do now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the scene where Charlie and Max finally put it together. Charlie's like, look, I got a guy, Burnett. He's a two-bit guy. It comes out of nowhere, says he's got 10 keys. We got this he guy. He pretends Co- to be Jamaican. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we got this guy, Cooper. He's got cash. He wants to buy drugs. He's willing to buy at any price. Found out through the grapevine that there are 10 keys missing from my vice lockup. Everything stinks here. This whole operation yeah. stinks. So at what, I mean, you know, the vice guys have got to know, like, it's going to look suspicious if Cooper needs exactly 10 keys and Barnett's selling exactly 10 keys. <laughs> like, try and offset it. Maybe, maybe. Uh, make it so Cooper only wants seven keys and talk him into the 10. Yeah, exactly. But I don't, you know, and then on top of that, they, Charlie then says like, fuck it. Let's just use the cops anyway. We know that they're cops. Let's just use them in this big Lydia deal that we have going on later. Like the biggest drug deal we've ever done. Let's involve the cops in it. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing. What kind of crime boss is like, we have a rat. We have an undercover cop. Uh, we have two of them now. We have two mm-hmm. undercover cops trying to pinch us. It's like, well, f it, bring them into the organization. Uh, <laughs> let them meet other crime, uh, uh, other crime people we deal with. Yeah, like, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> now it's going to accelerate. We see Charlie tell Crockett where the deal is going to go down. They come to terms on 33 a key. We see Max get Cooper to buy at 43 a key. So now Charlie's going to skim 10 grand a key here. Yeah, because Cooper's a terrible negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> he knows how much Barnett's selling them to him for. Yeah, exactly. He has insider knowledge. Like, he couldn't get a better deal than 43. <laughs> And then we see Charlie go to the bank, 
who has taken the ten grand a key he has skimmed, so a hundred thousand dollars, pulls it out of a safety deposit box and gives it to the bank for his quote unquote his corporate account. When we see him leave, we also see that the B team are out there in the bug van, which you would think they'd be in a more nondescript car than a green and black wild card van out on the street with a giant bug on the top of it, but no. Yeah. Oh, I guess banks have roach problems too. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> So now we go that night to where this big cell is going to go down between Cooper and Burnett. Charlie and Crockett take the boat out to like a stadium. They, are, are they doing this deal in Shamu's pool? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Cooper's there. And so, of course, the days before cell phones, Cooper and Burnett are like, oh, I recognize you. And this is great <laughs> because but Crockett gets out of the car and Charlie goes, hey, this is Cooper. And, and Tubbs turns to Crockett and says, quote, cool running. But in, in his <laughs> Jamaican voice. <laughs> cool running. <laughs> this is when Guy tells him, I know your cops. Flip messing around. I know your cops. The deal's in. You're not going to sneak past me. Thanks a lot for, for wasting my time, guys. See you later. But then Crockett drops some barnyard knowledge on him. Like, hey, I hope you didn't make a deposit on that money, which means that this is exactly what they wanted all along. That money that they took from lockup was counterfeit money. They were hoping that Charlie was going to put it together that Burnett and Cooper are cops. He would deposit, he would skim the money deposit it and now he's facing federal charges for dealing in uh, giving a hundred thousand dollars in counterfeit money to the bank so now the secret service can come in and take over the investigation and we don't have to watch anymore no right no and also this means that charlie who now knows that there are cops and so does max cooper and burnett can just continue to go about doing their drug deals all over miami right the rest of the of the drug dealers in the in the city of miami won't know now that they're police officers yeah yeah you know um so and we're ignoring the fact that you know stewardess could have balloons of coke in them at this <laughs> very moment <laughs> so let's talk about the guy with the counterfeit money eventually says let's make a deal we head over to the precinct and the duo are telling the finally checking in with castillo hey dad this is what we got going on this guy glide <laughs> He knows this Peruvian dealer that will get, but he'll only give him up if we give him total walk. Castillo eventually, essentially says, Castillo essentially says that they have to work with them. They have no choice. They really want to get the next person up. Which I kind of like the interrogation going on there. You know, just, you know, the interrogation technique of just staring and pretending to make a phone call. <laughs> Very effective. They're eventually able to get out of Charlie is that he's dealing with Lydia Sugarman of the Sugarman Electronics fame. And that after the 86-year-old founder died, his 26-year-old, 28-year-old Lydia Sugarman, his wife, wants to take over the company, but there's a board buyout problem. So her solution is to take the $15 million that she got from her late husband, triple it to $45 million, and then buy out the board. This makes total sense, right? This was going to work. She was going to buy $15 million in cocaine with having no drug dealing experience, triple her money, yes. and boom, she becomes CEO of an electronics company. <laughs> yes. So, and I missed the, and I didn't even realize there was so much sugar, you know, Lydia Sugarman, the sugar heiress to the sugar, co to the Sugarman company that I thought she was buying a sugar company. I was like, like she's going to use drugs to buy a sugar company. <laughs> yeah, watch out. There's been there's been sugar thefts around lately. <laughs> Crockett doesn't want to have doesn't want to make a deal with Charlie, but they have no choice. Dad has already said that they're that's that this is what they're gonna do. So after kicking the chair out from money Charlie, they decide that they're gonna make good on their deal. And now we head over to a very, very, very weird scene. So we're over at a boat. It's like a old boat that's falling apart, but on the inside, it's been totally refurbished to be like a hotel. It's and a very awkward dinner party. It, it's, it's, I guess, how you would imagine the tea party from Alice in Wonderland meets SpongeBob. <laughs> With lots of cocaine. <laughs> lots of cocaine. Yes. Yes, the cocaine's important. So Charlie set up this deal with this with Lydia and her connection or his I, I think at this point I should probably point out Lydia is played by Anne Carlisle. She was also in uh 
Crocodile Dundee. She actually co-wrote the movie Liquid Sky, and she was in the movie Desperately Seeking Susan with Madonna Hmm. and John Turturro. So, another Vice connection there. Hmm. She's also in the movie Perfect Strangers, and in 1984, she was in Playboy. Although I didn't write down the month, so you're going to have to scroll around a little bit if you want to see your nipples. (laughs) The red fro definitely doesn't help, but I was definitely curious. (laughs) So the meeting with Lydia and this other man named Sabato, who is coked out of his goddamn mind. He's just jamming food into his mouth with his hands. He's drinking champagne from the bottle. He can't stop laughing. He is coked out like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, you know, if Charlie and Max were were kind of t- taking it loose, like mm-hmm. this guy's over the top, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this weird conversation that they have meanders down to the Charlie sets the deal. It's going to be tomorrow at 8 p.m. It's going to be at a boathouse, and they'll they'll make this final deal for Lydia. Now let's dance. <laughs> I was hoping that we were going to stick around long enough to see Tubbs and Lydia dance. Yes, I know. I know. I, I love that. It was, it was, I even wrote down, shall we dance? <laughs> <laughs> by the way, our coked out friend played by Pepe Serna. I was telling you before the before the show that I thought he was just going to be a bunch of, like Colombian drug dealer roles and stuff like that. Thought, you know, but actually he's been in a lot of stuff that you know um, and not in that role. So he mm. was in the movie Car Wash. Mm. He was in the movie The Jerk. That's a Steve Martin movie. He was in that movie. He was in Honeysuckle Grows with Willie Nelson. Didn't see that one coming. He was in Red Dawn. <laughs> and I, I love Red Dawn. How do I not remember him in Red Dawn? Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so a few of his TV roles. He was He's guest starred on Kung Fu, Rockford Files, Beretta, TJ Hooker, Knight Rider, Hill Street Blues. So the boy likes cop shows. I that's will. a little bit more what I was expecting. <laughs> I, I would imagine that he was the guy in handcuffs in most of those episodes. <laughs> I will admit that it is tempting that when Miami Vice is over to do a Kung Fu podcast. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, Kung Fu or Quantum Leap. I'm convinced that they gave... Uh, um, What's the guy from Quantum Leap's name? I am so convinced that he has a show now because he can't jump until he wins it. Uh, <laughs> like, he's going to keep faking a New Orleans accent on NCIS Louisiana, <laughs> NCIS New Orleans, <laughs> until he until he wins one so he can jump. <laughs> the next day, we see at the precinct that Zito has some information on Savato. He's a, he like escaped the Peruvian military. They're all looking for him. He's just not a nice guy, basically. Castillo says. They're out back. They're out back looking for him. <laughs> Castillo basically, like, this all boils down to that Castillo says, like, look, we're, we're going to do the bus that's at this boathouse. Just remember who you're dealing with. So be prepared. You never know. You have no idea what's going to happen. And this is when we go to, we're going to come to the last finals, the final couple scenes before the episode comes to an end. In a twist, we see Max call Lydia. Max tells Lydia that Charlie knows that Cooper and Burnett are cops. And he thinks that it's Sabato that flipped them. But he's got all worked out. So now out. everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they have it worked out now that they will meet at a different location, be able to do the deal, and then everything will be just fine. The only thing that she needs to do is just make one small concession, which... I don't know 100% what that is. Is she going to take less money? Is she going to be the one to shoot and kill Sabato? Like, I, I don't understand what the concession is supposed to be. I believe the concession is that she's supposed to let one of her guys die with them. Oh, I got it now. Because that's what's going to happen at Sabato's boat, too. We see yes, Sonny and, uh, Sonny and, and Rico pull up in his boat. They do a boat swap and get into to one of Charlie's boats to go make the deal over at the boathouse. And you see Sabato hug one of his own men and then he gets into the boat. No, like Sabato knows that he's sending off one of his own to go get killed. And so that mean that would make sense that one of Lydia's yeah. men needs to get killed too. Yeah. Basically he asked her to sacrifice a pawn so that the, everything went, went as planned. Yeah. And so, and when they get over to the boathouse, we see it's like flashing as they're driving up to the boathouse and we see Sabato and Glide talking. 
and we hear Sabato say, like, yeah, there's a bomb in the, basically there's a bomb in the house. When Tubbs and Crockett get inside the boathouse, they see on the garage door opener as it starts to close down, the contact for the bomb is going to explode. They dive out just in time for all the pawns to be killed, but Sonny and Rico to survive. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, what do they do? They head straight over to go talk to Max who was macking on like 15 bikini clad women at one time. Can I ask a question? Can cops actually just like commandeer boats and stuff? <laughs> I don't, like, they like, seem can to be they able actually, to. Uh, but I mean, in real life, like you always see it in the cop shows. Like, give me that bike. Yeah. You know, and they throw the little girl <laughs> on the ground. Horse. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like it, can, can they actually do that? Or is that just a bunch of bullshit? Because, I mean, if they can't actually do that in real life, then I want to know just in case someone tries. Yeah, if they can't do that in real life, I want my scooter back, goddammit. it. Exactly. <laughs> 18 years, damn it. 18 years since that <laughs> cop took my scooter and I haven't gotten it back yet. Uh-huh. <laughs> so now after they grab Max, Max says that he knows whether the deal is going down. They steal someone else's boat who was making, they were making out inside the boat. And then they take that <laughs> to go bring down the last deal. We head over. This is the final I scene. I love how they bring Charlie with them. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Max, you know, and I know, I mean, I guess he's supposed to like give them directions, like turn here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, but like, like he's that he's gonna be kind of useless in this whole next part. But <laughs> I'm pretty sure he takes a bullet in this next part. I'm pretty sure too. Like, like uh, he might have been happier if they just left him on the dock. Like, just put him in handcuffs and just like leave him there. Or like he said, he couldn't swim, but he made it better off. They just would have thrown him in the water. At least he would have had a chance. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So this is the final scene of the episode. Lydia is there. She's paying a- everyone out. Like cash, like everyone's Her just hair lined is fantastic. up. Fantastic. <laughs> she looks like Ronald McDonald. <laughs> she does. She does. She has a white woman's afro, you know, with the big <laughs> curls. Yeah. And she's like wearing extra makeup. So she's super pasty white. With this gigantic bright red afro. Bright, bright red. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> when she gets to Sabato, she just k- shoots him. Just shoots him right in the chest and then moves one step over to the left and starts talking to Charlie. Asking him why he never gets flipped on, why n- n- nothing ever bad happens to him. And in the meantime, Tubbs and Crockett just come running up between the boats and just shout out Miami Vice. And start shooting two against like literally a hundred people that are stationed around this deal going down. Yeah, just fucking like guns <laughs> blazing, just <laughs> come rolling up in your stolen boat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm pretty sure Max gets shot in the back. A bunch of other people get shot, and then as Lydia tries to run away, the Miami Police Department's able to stop her. So they've actually captured everyone. None of that the main hair wasn't very windy. Res- <laughs> that hair was more wind resistant. Uh, what was <laughs> very when you resisted you know <laughs> so now in the final conversation sunny grabs charlie and starts calling him out like hey you changed the meeting you set us up you were only thinking of yourself you didn't help us out at all and charlie says hey this is what you signed up for they changed they changed it on the last minute they knew you were cops this isn't my fault and just when you think that charlie's gonna get away with it all Castillo comes walking up with a gun, with that gigantic gun in a plastic bag, and asks him if it's his gun. Yeah. Charlie says yes, and Castillo says this is the gun that shot and killed Tim, Sarah's brother. And so now they're arresting him for murder one. Yeah, conveniently, it was his gun that Max used to commit the murder, and he just happened to keep it on him. And so now he's dead inside the boat after being taken hostage. So now Charlie gets arrested and everything's all closed. Book him, Dano. Yeah, it's it just wraps up very conveniently. Brings that Sarah story to a full close. Just enough. On a to, sad to side note, up. three more flight attendants died after this episode. <laughs> so Right now, or sorry, right then, over in Miami. There was a coked up stewardess going fucking crazy on an airplane, running up and down the aisle. Yes. People trying to tackle her, holding her down. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) So that's the end of the episode. That that covers everything that happened. We actually get a full story. Everyone gets arrested. No loose ends are left, except for that the that we actually know the actor as Lavici is going to come back and deal with Al Lombard again in a future episode. So, but you know, everything's summed up. 
That's, yeah, uh, but you know, Ch- Ch- Charlie's a, a pretty slick cat, so you know <laughs> he'll just change his name and and go run another crime family. <laughs> he can also be his own de- attorney because he's also a defense attorney. Exactly. <laughs> Let's go over and talk about the music in this episode. All right, John, I did a quick glance at what the music is this week. And although it's not the big name bands like what we've seen in season one, we do have some classic Vice people here. So, I mean, Michael Mann or is he still the showrunner? We haven't yes. lost him yet, right? No, we get so him all the way through season two. Okay, whether it's Michael Mann or Jan Hammer that chooses the music for this, I'm not exactly sure. Whoever is choosing the music, you're, we're starting to see a lot of a theme here. Like, you see an artist repeat. We're kind of seeing a, a kind of behind the scenes on why some of these songs were, were chosen. Music, you know, we have three songs and they all fall kind of right along that line. Let's start with Par Avion which is the first song by Mike and the Mechanics. Mike and the Mechanics are Mike Rutherford of Genesis's Mm. side project. They formed in 85. At the time of the episode, this was like their first projects. Everyone's like, hey, it's the guitarist from Genesis. Like, this is going to be good. I guess it was. (laughs) For a little bit. (laughs) During a break from Genesis, Rutherford actually had tried his hand as a solo artist. He released two albums, Small Creeps Day in 1980 and Acting Very Strange in 1982, which something creepy or strange about that. (laughs) Things weren't working on his own, so he formed the band featuring uh, vocalist Paul Kerak, formerly of the band Ace. And then he also, also Paul Young, Adrian Lee, and Peter Van Hook until Lee and Van Hook would have uh, left the van in ninety, the band in ninety five. So they had ten strong years together. In ninety five, they would leave the band, and then a few years later, in two thousand, Young would die of a heart attack, oh. uh, leaving just Rutherford and Carrick. And the duo actually tried to keep things together until two thousand four when they finally called it quits. Reason why Miami Vice, other than the fact that they're Genesis and Michael Mann loves Genesis, their first album scored three top 40 songs. Yeah, the two top tens being Silent Running and All I Need Is a Miracle. So they were actually, they actually were pretty successful as a side project. In 2009, Rutherford basically replaced all the dead or left members. (laughs) So pretty much... Rutherford, with an entirely new band, took the name Mike and the Mechanics again and has gone back on the road. He also released an album called The Road. So moving on, our second song of the episode is A Harder They Come by Jimmy Cliff. So Jimmy Cliff is a reggae singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and actor. Apparently, he is extremely famous in Jamaica. (laughs) Kind of sort of famous in the U.S. But he's the only living musician to be awarded the Order of Merit by the Jamaican government for uh, his contributions to art and science. Damn. That's a a pretty big award to be the only one to ever win it. Like, they name it after you, and then we're never going to give this out again. Oh, well, no. He's the only living member, meaning they've Uh, only given it to people after they've died um, uh, as, like, an honor. He's the only living one. Like, you're so good, you're going to get it now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> he is reggae. He started in 1962 He when he moved into his cousin's one-room apartment in Kingston and made a name for himself through the 60s and 70s in reggae. He even starred in the movie The Harder They Come, which is a Jamaican crime drama, but is widely recognized for basically bringing re- reggae to the mainstream. So, like, the soundtrack to this movie from Jamaica is, like, really what caught people's attention in America and Europe with reggae. So, we get, when we get into the 80s, Jimmy Cliff toured with people like Cool and the Gang and Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. What an Um, odd combination. Yeah. Why is he featured in Miami Vice? Because in 1985, he won a Grammy for Best Reggae Album. So, yeah, Uh, he's top of mind. Yeah. Yeah, and that was actually his last major success in the U.S. as far as music would go. But in 1986, 
He would also star in the Harold Ramis movie, Club Paradise. Yeah. So other than that, he also toured with, uh, or I'm sorry, he also worked with artists like the Rolling Stones, Stephen Van Zandt of Leonard Skinner, and Elvis Costello. You're going to love this, Dominic. He appeared in the movie Marked for Death with uh, Steven Seagal. Yes. Him and his band performed the song John Crow in that movie. Yes, and then um, Seagal throat punched every one of them. <laughs> yes, yes. That was Jimmy Cliff. I want to watch, so, a, 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 on and off topic, I would totally watch a Steven Seagal movie where it's just a line of people. He just comes up and he does the double ear slap and then, and then chops him in the throat. <laughs> just like yeah, what I have of him just doing that. Other things you might know Jimmy Cliff from. He covered Johnny Nash's "I Can See Clearly Now" for the movie mm. Cool Runnings. And last but not least, he performed a Hakuna Matata for the Lion King. Oh, interesting. Yes, he is by far the most famous artist on this list. Now, getting back to more Miami Vice repetitiveness in the music our last song is your time is going to come by russ ballard he is a british singer songwriter his music is in a couple very iconic miami vice moments yeah so let's see he gave let me see i have that i have this written down but it's not in order so let's see his song voices was featured in calderon's return part two mm-hmm. his song into the night was featured in calderon's return part one so this is his third appearance yep so and i don't think it's his last no, and if so, you remember right, the Voices song in Cal Drones Return Part 2, it's in the opening montage of them taking the boat out to St. Andrews. Yes, yeah. I mean, what can we say more about Russ Ballard? He was the lead singer and guitarist of Argent. So mm. I decided this time maybe I would actually try to figure out if I actually knew any of his songs. And you know what? I do know the song Hold Your Head Up. You know, and if you heard it, you know, it's one, Hold Your Head Up Now. Oh, okay. Your, yeah. Yeah. That's that's Argent. So gotcha. that that's him. I also found out that he wrote a crap of the songs for other people. He's one of those people where he other people do better performing his music than he does. <laughs> I mean, I, I I guess that's the best way to put it. Because I mean, l- listen to this: the song "New York Groove" he wrote was covered by Ace Frehley in 1978 when Ace Frehley was releasing his solo stuff. Santana's 1981 hit "Winning" was wrote mm. by him off the album Z-Bop. He wrote the song for ABBA singer Amfred Lindstadt's 1982 hit, I Know There's Something Going On, Hmm. which, by the way, was produced by Phil Collins and featured Phil Collins on drums. Oh, weird. So we're just stuck in Miami Vice world. Yeah. This music segment reminds me, whenever we get to this, but especially this one, is that we are far removed from 1985. And when I look at the list of people who are on the music, I'm like, oh, a bunch of nobodies. And then you start to talk about it, like especially the guy in the middle, the the reggae artist. It's like, no, actually, he was a big deal. It was a big deal to have his music on the episode. Yeah, I had no idea. You know, just learning what I did about Jimmy Cliff, man, this guy is iconic. And I would have never known. I would have yeah. never had any idea just hearing that song. 31 oh. years removed from when this episode aired. Like yeah. it's, it's easy to forget like that there's a lot of people who are a big deal when these episodes came out that we just kind of write them off now. Yeah. So what's not a big deal is that Russell Ballard was also covered by the Bay City Rollers, <laughs> Night Ranger, random <laughs> kiss members, not together, but randomly oh. uh, themselves, <laughs> Santana and America. So, Damn. yeah, Damn. I want to hear the Night Ranger song. I bet you I know it. <laughs> I kind of want to hear the Australian band wanting to be in an American band cover Russ Ballard. Yes. <laughs> the Australian band wanting to be in an American band covering the British singer songwriter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's go over and, and in this episode, let's go talk about our final thoughts. 
All right, John, kind of informal final thoughts here instead of one after the other. This is, you know, this was an okay. It was the okayest episode of Miami Vice that I've seen f- from this season so far. The storyline was okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was the averagest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, it's, it's another week where they totally summed up the storyline too. There's no loose ends. Yeah. You know what's not, you know, and that's what's weird is it's like we're finally getting a nice, concise procedural and yet these seem to be the most mundane episodes like it's the crazy ones that make no sense that seem to get us all worked up you know when they finally actually do a cop procedural show and they cut out a lot of the nonsense uh now granted and you heard the rundown just like us it's not exactly a cop procedural they didn't cut out all of the wackiness but it's a much more law and order dick wolf which is coming style episode. Yep. What I thought was interesting is the reuse of the same actor from the Liberici storyline to be Charlie Glide. And this is what some of my frustration is with Miami Vice sometimes is that I wish he would have been Liberici and that they weren't able to bring him down. But then I feel like I'm part of the universe every week. How do we get another millionaire playboy drug dealer in Miami? How do they not know who Cooper and Burnett are? I wish we had more continuity that there's like this really big guy. There's like a handful of these really big guys. And when you hear about Mm -hmm. a story, it's like, oh, this is a lieutenant for the Liberici family. And maybe this will get us closer to Fred Rico, but then it never happens. Like, because then you, because then you go into it. Like, I I recognize that name. I know who the Liberici family is. Instead, we get a whole new cast of people who go to jail and then we'll never hear from it, from any of them again. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with you. I think that, that they don't capitalize on like, having like different gangs like the triads and the mm-hmm. mafia you know they don't have preset crime families that they're you know that they're kind of working against you kind of getting these random characters and then we are more than 10 we are more than 10 episodes into season two and they're still and they are still reusing characters it is kind of strange you would expect a show in the very beginning like like just getting things together that it you know might accidentally or like over a long period of time that someone who guest starred in season one might be guest starring as someone else in season six but the episodes are so close together that they reuse actors it's crazy it's almost like like how did they not get called out for this at the time i don't know and if you remember with labrici he's in the second to last or the, the last episode of the first season. Lombard is the last episode of the first season. We are only literally 13 episodes away from when that, ap- from that episode. Yeah. And I want to say this is the third or fourth different reoccurring character, uh, reoccurring actor playing a different character this season. Yeah. We get them so, a lot. So it was, it was, it was quite surprising. Like I was saying, this is, this episode was okay. It was entertaining. I stuck through it the yeah. whole time. Um, I actually had an opportunity to watch it twice. So, <laughs> um. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Sorry for the sick voice that you've had talking at you this whole week. And sorry Melissa wasn't able to join us. We always miss her perspective, especially in the brooding Crockett episodes. So she always, you know, I always get the feeling from melissa that she doesn't like the brooding crockett episodes because she's like suck it up man come on get your shit together yeah yeah quit being a baby (laughs) that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode we will definitely be back next week sorry for the week off there this uh the sudden week off but we're all back on the health train so we should be getting rolling again be sure to subscribe to the episode tell your friends about it if they would maybe like just listen to us jabber on about miami vice we'd love for you to share it around maybe leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice pocket cast itunes google play you can pretty much find us anywhere including youtube and stitcher check out the website go with the heat.com emails we would love to hear from you about miami vice go with the heat at gmail.com that's gonna do it for us this week and we'll catch you all next time see you next week people